Yep. Well, we were just chit-chatting about fellowships, so I'm sorry. We're ah, okay. a little slow in getting started. Teresa, how are in, you doing? Fellowships in, in Retina? In Retina. Okay, yeah. if anybody, I'm, I'm happy to contribute if you want. Yeah, well, what do you think? What's what's your current take on the fellowship situation in Retina? Um, most of them don't give you enough time to really sort of absorb a lot of the medical as well as surgical side, um, I think. Yeah. And, um, uh, it, it just it, it takes it takes a long time to learn. But so there were a bunch of us that uh, would basically take on junior partners who had finished their fellowship. And we usually said it takes five years after they finish their fellowship to sort of get them in the mode of handling patients, handling referring physicians, handling handling the whole nine yards. Right. Um, I mean, we can talk about various fellowships around the country if you wish. Uh, Let's do the lecture. That's what we're here for. And then maybe if we have some time later on. Sure, we'll sure. I'm sorry, gang. I apologize. So today we're talking about wait, lasers wait, wait, wait. and golf I'm, I'm an old force. Your pardon? I'm an old force. Old fart of retina. Now go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so we're talking about posterior segment lasers. So we'll be talking about photocoagulation, transpupillary thermotherapy, and photodynamic therapy. And so um, coagulative necrosis occurs at 149 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the area and volume uh, or diameter and depth of laser treatment is directly related to the power and duration of the laser, and much more so than the theoretical differences between wavelengths of the laser. So we'll talk about indications for treatment and delivery systems. We'll discuss wavelength and color, uh, power and duration, anesthesia and lens selection, and then pitfalls and complications. So um, some of the indications for photocoagulation would be penretinal photocoagulation for neovascularization, focal laser treatment for macular edema, uh, closure of microaneurysms and, and telangiectasia like in Coates disease, uh, creation of chorioretinal adhesion, so this is of course used in, in treating retinal breaks and retinal detachment, focal ablation of extra foveal coronal neovascular membranes. Now, when Dr. Sinclair was training, this was a very common thing. In today's world, some of these lasers you probably don't see or use very much at all and probably won't get a lot of experience with in residency, I would guess. Uh, the other thing too is since some of the studies like Protocol S of the DRCR network came out, you know, I think that PRP is still used, but not used as much as it used to be. One of the things as I was reviewing these slides for this talk is I was, I thought it would be really interesting to pull up all the Medicare data and kind of see what the laser codes have done over the past 10 to 15 years. And I would guess that you would see a dramatic drop off in laser codes. For instance, focal laser treatment for diabetic macular edema. Have you guys had a chance to do that or had much experience with that in residency? I don't think any of us have done that. Yeah. We have people that we do FAs to see if they might be like a good candidate for it, but. More for like Mac, uh, at MAs, like yeah. they'll, uh, they'll do focal for it, but yeah. I don't think for. Do, do, you, do, so do, do you do any micropulse laser? No. All for macular edema. Do you guys do? Is, Steve, did you do micropulse in your practice? Yeah, I've, 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 I've done a huge and published a lot of micropulse. Oh, that's why I'm really? sort of prejudiced. But I just want to know whether anybody's done it here. You know, we don't have micropulse in our office, and part of it is just everything's been so taken over by anti VEGF therapy. And then yeah, if they, and the pharma world is just dominating yeah. our, our workplace. Yeah. You're right. But, you know, in addition to that, that if they fail anti VEGF therapy is the first line. Then we usually go to Osirdex or you know some sort of steroid or Alluvian. But anyway, so it is. It's really changed over time. Yeah. So um, other things that uh, so you can use focal laser treatment to treat uh, central serous corneal retinopathy. Or uh, um, and then you can also use photocoagulation of some intraocular tumors. So things like coronal hemangiomas, and sometimes it's used even to treat coronal melanomas, small coronal melanomas. Uh, there are different delivery systems that can be used for laser, of course. There's slit lamp delivery system. There's micropulse laser. So, Steve, I'm, I'm really curious to hear about your experience with micropulse laser. Frankly, I haven't used it, and I'm not very familiar with it. It was something that came into vogue after I finished my fellowship, and we don't have micropulse laser. I've seen the presentations and papers, but I don't have any practical experience with it. So what's your experience with okay, micropulse laser? Okay, practical experience is that for mild macular edema, when the vision is good and the fovea is involved, do you want to do any kind of laser treatment, or do you want to give anti-VEGF injections when the vision is relatively good but the fovea is involved? So we found that uh, Jeff Luttrell and I have published that this uh, micropulse laser works very well at 
resolving the edema, and actually improving the vision. But you've got to measure the vision in real world context. You can't use visual acuity, because visual acuity, come on gang, we've used it for 170 years, and it does not measure vision. It has never been validated. It's the longest thing in use in medicine, but it's never been validated. But we all use it. But when you use different, um, let's call it vision testing, that measures real world vision under real world context, it shows it a significant improvement. And in AMD, we're seeing dramatic reduction in the development of coronal neovascularization and a really significant reduction in the rate of progression of geographic atrophy. So, it's, so we're sort of thinking, beginning to think about it, and 810 now is used much more than 532, the yellow wavelength of Iridex. The 810 is now sort of becoming preferred for, micro -pulse. for the micropulse treatment. Yeah. I don't know how often you, you have it up here. You use it for more photocoagulative kind of processes. Yeah. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing sort of that. But for macular treatments, uh, when we're starting much earlier in the disease process, I think the micropulse is going to have a, a, a real mixed relationship. With the with the antivegetant. So, do you use it in uh, in macular degeneration to coagulate drusen and things like that? Is that yes, yes. So, you know, there was the was the Kappa trial that was yeah. done during my residency years. Did you do that? Yes, I but, did. but it, it, it didn't but work, the right? I mean, the, did not work. The takeaway is work. that it didn't work, right? The, the rates of choroidal neovascular, even though you got rid of the drusen, it created enough injury, and this is what we're worried about with the nanopulse laser injury kind of trials too is that although you can reduce drusen, what are you doing to that pigment epithelium that is, that is injurious, so you're still going to get the choroidal neovascularization as a secondary right. quality. Because now they're showing that choroidal neovascularization and spread of geographic atrophy, well, soft drusen, yeah, but the worst things are, are the pseudo drusen, the calcified drusen, and other things, and pigment epithelial um, hyperpigmentation and other changes that are going on that we're sort of not realizing yet that are really predicting the progression of the macular degeneration. I think you're going to see a lot of this in the next five years and I think farm is going to try to get into it but I think in the meantime uh, if I predict I think micropulse laser is going to really sort of come to the fore. <clears throat> But study, study, studies still need to be done, gang. Anybody want well, to go I and mean, with and all the, help me? I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> with all the complement factor numbers that are coming out and being tested for dry AMD, it'll be interesting to see exactly. what the yin and yang of laser versus complement factor inhibitors will be. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so laser energy is absorbed by melanin, and that's what creates the photocoagulation. So the laser goes into the eye, it hits the RPE where the melanin is, and that creates the coagulative necrosis. Um, so macular xanthophil, so, so the pigment that's in the central macula absorbs blue light relatively well, but not yellow or red. But you're saying that the red is actually kind of the laser of choice now for... It's, it's now becoming, um, again, in the photocoagulation world, we try to reduce the injury as much as we could because... Um, what Greg, what, what a bunch of us showed is that... So you photocoagulate the microaneurysm or the telangiectasia or you're treating the edema as we used to do in the ETDR study, but 90% of your laser energy is absorbed by the RPE. Yeah. And that laser scar expands 300 plus percent over time. The problem here, it extends over three to five years. So in most of the studies that were done with two-year follow-ups or barely three-year follow-ups, when you're using visual acuity as your outcomes, they didn't show the bad effect of the photocoagulation. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm annotating on top of Please no, go on. No, that's on. fine. No, yes. those, those are wonderful yeah. insights. Thank you. Um, the other thing is back in the day when we relied on laser treatment, so in the pre anti vegf era, so... I did my residency from 2000, well, I was an intern here from 2001 to 2002, and then at Iowa from 2002 to 2005. Anti-VEGF came out right at the end of my residency and beginning of my fellowship. So you probably know Jim Folk from the Kappa yeah, trial. So Jim was one of my, my mentors at the University of Iowa. But anyway, 
back in the days before anti-VEGF therapy, we'd see a bad diabetic or a bad central retinal vein occlusion patient come in with a lot of vitreous hemorrhage, and we'd try to get laser treatment into their eye, and we'd always use red laser treatment. And the reason we'd use red is because it's not as well absorbed by hemoglobin, whereas blue, green, and yellow are much more absorbed by hemoglobin. So we would just be desperately trying to get as much laser treatment into the retinal periphery as we could, but we'd always use red, and that's because it wasn't absorbed by the hemoglobin. Um, so this just talks about the different wavelengths, different colors that are used. Um, so green and yellow are often used for just routine photocoagulation. We would use um, focal laser treatment using yellow laser primarily when I was in my residency and fellowship. Um, blue laser treatment is, is not something that I think has been done for a long time. You know, by the time I came around, it was all green and yellow mostly, and then red to penetrate through vitreous hemorrhage. And then infrared, 810, um, as of course is used in micropulse laser treatment. Um, so these are some of the sample settings. How many of you guys have done panretinal photocoagulation for diabetic retinopathy? Have most of you done PRP? Do you guys still get a chance to do PRP? Yeah. At the VA, you do quite a bit? Yeah. You do quite do, a bit. How here do you too. decide how yeah. much laser to put in and how many sessions to do it over? How do you decide? I mean, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think for us, we're learning. And so the first time that you sit down and you use a contact lens at the slit lamp, it can be kind of challenging to find the view and remember, yeah. you know, that everything's inverse. And so a lot of it for us at the VA is based on how well and how quickly we can do it and how much the patient can tolerate. Um, because I think we do have a lot of patients who need very dense PRP, but you just kind of do what you can, and then if it's not enough, then you just bring them back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, you so do you always use this slit lamp with the contact lens, like a super quad or a That's what quadrospheric? Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Or rodenstock, if you guys use the rodenstock. Sometimes if they have a really heavy brow, you know, uh, or a prominent brow, sometimes the rodenstock's nice. It's got almost like a little more of a shaft on it so that you can get around the brow. Um, what kind of anesthesia do you use for pen retinal photocoagulation? Topical. Topical? Yeah. You ever do subconj or block them? Or bridge them over block? I haven't done that yet. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in my residency and fellowship, we'd often block them. That was kind of the routine. We usually do a retrobulbar block for pen retinal photocoagulation. I've gotten away from that. I don't do that. I also like using the Endirect to do PRP. Um, I don't know why, maybe it's just the fact that I'm not as much in one area and I kind of scatter it around a little bit more, I'm moving around a little bit more, but sometimes I think the indirect is almost a little bit better tolerated when I do it that way. In some ways it's a little faster too. Um, but Teresa, I think to your point, I think it's good to get as much in as they can tolerate in a session and then bring them back if you need to. Also the billing for PRP changed here within the last couple of years, where it used to be a 90 day global period, now it's a 10 day global period. So we get paid a lot less now for PRP, but you know, if you do PRP, it used to be that when I was in my residency and fellowship, a lot of the attendings at Iowa felt strongly about not just blasting them with PRP and doing like 1500 spots in one session. So we'd often do like four or 500 spots and break it up into, you know, two or three sessions. Steve, what's your MO for laser treatment? Yeah, the downside of PRP, two downsides of PRP. I mean, it's amazing to me that even though the diabetes goes on forever, it really stops the, let's call it progressive retinopathy of the capillary occlusion. Now you can sometimes get a little bit more capillary occlusion toward the fovea from the temporal side, but the, always the question has been, how much PRP do I put in? Do I fill the ischemic areas that I may see on wide angle and geography? Do any of you do this? Or do you just put it in everywhere? Because the secondary downside is the constricted visual field, because remember, if these spots, if you're putting them one burn, you put them all one burn width apart or one half burn width apart, they expand to coalesce to form a solid peripheral visual field defect. That's 15, 20 degrees. If you're taking it tight into the disc, that's the temporal side on that eye, that's 15, 20 degrees outside of your visual field. Well, the other, so, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm just sort of saying these are some of the downsides. The other downside is if you're trying to put in a lot of PRP with the indirect, the, remember you can aggravate the macular edema by just burning the hell out of them. Yeah. So the whole question I think that's now coming down is how much PRP do I put in? How, how hot a burns do I put in? And how close do I, do I bring it back? Do I just treat the ischemic areas or is the, is, 
relatively ischemic area at the border of the, what I can see as capillary non-perfusion, contributing. Right. Yeah. That's, those are just all comments that we don't know. Well, the other thing, too, is nyctalopia, so yeah. night vision problems. So constricted visual field and night vision difficulty. And those are tough things with <coughs> PRP. So how do you decide in whom you do PRP versus in whom you do anti-VEGF therapy? Any thoughts on that? Reliability of the patient to come back. Yeah, yeah, that's, for me, and that's a very subjective assessment, isn't it? I mean, but if you have somebody and you're worried about, uh, particularly about payment issues or their ability to get rides or take off work to come in, you know, and you've got to get something in there that's going to keep them from progressing to a tractional retinal detachment or massive vitreous hemorrhage or something like that. So it's, it's really variable. I've got a young lady who's probably in her early 30s. She's been type, type 1 diabetic now for 20 years. Super reliable. She comes in to see me every couple of months. We're down to every couple of months now, and I give her an Avastin shot in both eyes every couple of months for her proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But she doesn't want the constricted visual field. She doesn't want nyctalopia. She's super reliable. She's got great insurance. She's got it together. And so she's, she prefers anti-VEGF therapy. In a patient like that, I think it's a great treatment. It also kind of kills two birds with one stone in that you can also treat any diabetic macular edema that's kind of cropping up or it helps to keep the macular edema at bay. So, anyway. But how long do you keep it up? What are we using for endpoints with anti-VEGF you know, in PDR? In, in her, it's indefinite. And, <laughs> and I think that she... And we've had the you know very frank discussion about this numerous times that you know this might go on for the rest of her life and she's like okay bring it you know I'm fine with this, but you know it's it's nice to have some PRP in because I think it decreases the the VEGF drive, and so it uh, kind of keeps things under control in general. Anyway. Yeah, but uh, just to just to you know to amplify what he said is we don't have a long term follow up to know what happens with the ischemic retina. In the aftermath of when you stop anti-VEGF, once you've involuted the neo, right. but later on, gang, what's going to happen here? And how often do I follow this patient? What do I do yeah, in order to try to define my long-term um, thing? Because I think the patients like you have are rare. Yeah. In other words, to keep coming back and keep doing it, and then it's not until, oh, shit, I got another victory <laughs> sandwich, and now... Well, you know, and the other problem, too, is if they get hospitalized or if they're, you know, if they're really, which diabetics often are, they're really sick people in general, and so they get hospitalized or they go to a skilled nursing facility for a while, they fall off the map, and then they're, the proliferative <coughs> he goes crazy. So, anyway, these are just some sample settings. MPS-style laser, um, again, you probably won't see this in your residency or fellowship. Um, I, I think it's pretty rare anymore, but we used to do the MPS style laser occasionally when it was an extra foveal proteal neovascular membrane. We do that in my residency and early in my fellowship, but then anti VEGF therapy came along and it just entirely changed everything. So, um, anesthesia, we've touched on this a little bit. There's topical, subconjunctival, retro bulbar. For retinal tears and um, sometimes localized retinal detachments, I really like subconjunctival because you're not blocking the entire eye, you don't have to patch them afterwards, and yet it seems like, especially if you let them sit there for 15 to 20 minutes, it provides adequate anesthesia to be able to do your retinal tear, retinal uh, detachment, demarcation. Uh, in terms of lens selection, there are a couple of different lens, uh, lenses that you can use. You can use the negative power plano concave lenses or the high plus power lenses, and these each result in different magnification, laser spot magnification. So if you use like the focal laser lenses, like the Goldman 3 mirror, the Yanuzi lens, it doesn't magnify the lens spot very much. You get a lens spot that's fairly true to what you have on your laser setting. Whereas for panoramic <coughs> coagulation, if you're looking for a wider angle lens, like a super quad or a quadrospheric lens, you'll get increased spot magnification. But the other thing too, to Dr. Sinclair's point, that you get laser creep is what we always would call it. You get expansion of the laser spot size so I think that, you know, when you're doing panretinal photocoagulation, I'm always, uh, I mean, I look at my patients who had panretinal photocoagulation in the 70s or 80s, and, you know, their, la their peripheral retinas are just hammered. I mean, they've got basically confluent laser. And, and I'm a little more ginger with their laser. I want to treat it enough that I control the neovascular process, but I, I don't just, bump, I don't carpet bomb them. I, I try to be a little bit more discreet in the way I treat it. Nevertheless, you've got to treat enough to, to keep the neovascular process under control. Any questions?
Steve, any comments? No, very good. Um, yeah, I, I think this whole aspect of how much peripheral laser treatment we got to do to try to control the process and get the good results that we've all experienced, but not create the nictalopia that, you know, they, and, and, and even, even under mesopic conditions, you go to that romantic restaurant, and these, these people, even though they don't, don't have gross macular edema, do have significant difficulties. Yeah. So I think all the PRP, we're going to reevaluate in terms of, of making much, much lighter burns, uh, and even some people are trying micropulse laser for PRP, but uh, they're sort of on the cutting edge and we don't know yet. And so, but we're just going to lighter treatment and maybe just treating the ischemic areas that we see rather than bringing it tight into the disc and one or two disc diameters from the vascular arcades, which we used to do, just as a gross treatment. Right. So all of these things, I think, are... PRP is still part of our regimen, but we're, 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 we're working on trying to change that treatment aspect. Right. Great insights. These are some of the potential complications. The worst ones I've seen are accidental foveal burns or laser treatment, really heavy focal laser treatment adjacent to or through the fovea. And I've seen some patients who have come in with just really, really bad maculas as a result of this. Uh, the other things are things like we talked about. So, you know, things like peripheral visual field constriction, nyctalopia. And then if you create a break in, in uh, Brooks membrane and the RPE, then they can get crotal neovascularization. So that's why when you do focal laser treatment, you start out really light. You start out with a setting typically of like 80 uh, milliwatts and then gradually go up until you're getting the treatment, the desired treatment effect. Now, as I understand it, micropulse does not have uh, those same types of complications typically that focal laser treatment well, traditionally has. Exactly. The, the whole idea with the micropulse now, and we've, there's been a huge amount of basic research to sort of show within <coughs> this realm of for, for 810 nanometers or for 532, this amount of, of laser milliwatts, but the key there is 5% duty cycle. At 5% duty cycle, you're getting no retinal injury that we can perceive by anything, even two and three years afterward. But the whole question is, all right, gang, if this is a healing laser that I'm applying, how often do I have to apply it? And I'm a surgeon. I like to see when I'm treating, I want to see the burns. But the thing here is we don't want to see this with the micropulse. We just want to induce some sort of healing like the anti-VEGF. So again, this is undergoing, I think, a huge um, evaluation at this point in time. What are the best modes of treatment for central serous or soft cruising or soft cruising with the attachments? But that's another another time, another another thing. But this well, is, that's one of those things. The that's pulse is coming. I think coming to the fore, but it's it still is is um, we're trying to figure out how to put it into our regimen. Next topic: transpupillary thermotherapy. This has, in my mind, really fallen out of favor. I don't know anybody who does this anymore. It used to be used for crotal melanoma and sometimes crotal neovascularization. It's a thermal laser treatment. And um, sometimes they would use a sandwich technique where they would treat the tumor with transpupillary thermotherapy, and then they'd also plaque it. Part of the concern about this is that if you just do transpupillary thermotherapy for, th thermotherapy for small melanoma, then it would create kind of a fibrotic cap on the top of the melanoma, and sometimes then it would grow posteriorly and extend through the sclera. So that was one of the concerns about transpupillary thermotherapy. Um, I only know one doctor, so I treat tumors, and I only know of one doctor who's doing TTT at this point in time. But again, this is almost becoming a relic, but still something that we need to talk about or mention. Yeah, I think the Shields, if I could just comment, the, the, she, the Jerry and Carol, Carol Shields are still doing a little bit, but it's fallen way down. Uh, you're right, because underneath this crotal melanoma, you can't figure out with ultrasound or whatever how deep it's gone into the choroid and or sclera. That's yeah. the problem. Well, and that's the challenge. And the problem is if you create a fibrotic cap and then you get posterior extension of the tumor, that's just, that's a very bad situation. I mean, then you're looking at almost an exoneration type of situation, so. 
Um, the next topic is photodynamic therapy. So we used to use this a lot for coronal neovascularization. I actually still use it for central serous choroidal retinopathy. I actually think, especially if you've got fovea involving CSCR, I think it's actually a really good treatment for that with multiple small points of sort of indiscreet leakage around the fovea when you're worried about doing focal laser treatment. So with central serous choroidal retinopathy, if you've got like one specific discrete smokestack area of of leakage on your fluorescein angiogram and it's a disc diameter away from the fovea, you know, I don't really worry about treating that with focal laser treatment. I feel very comfortable treating that with focal laser treatment. But if they've got a couple of little smudgy leaky areas right around the fovea, I do worry about treating that with focal laser just because of my concern about causing paracentral scotomas. So I've actually had quite a bit of success treating these with photodynamic therapy. So photodynamic therapy is, uh, it's a red spectrum laser, so it's I think 689 um, uh, nanometers on the wavelength. It's 689 nanometers. And so usually when we do it in conjunction with vertiporphin, we inject the vertiporphin, we wait 15 minutes, and then we treat with photodynamic therapy for 82 seconds. Um, it's also, it works really well for choroidal hemangioma. So choroidal hemangiomas, often just melt away once you treat them with photodynamic therapy. And in fact, I've treated, I've treated uh, diffuse choroidal hemangioma associated with Sturge-Weber syndrome with photodynamic therapy and had success doing that as well. So photodynamic therapy still has its role in the world. If you talk to the vertiporphin people, they will advocate for treating it, treating macular degeneration. And sometimes <coughs> it's actually useful in some types, some subtypes of macular degeneration, like sometimes um, polypoidal or RAP lesions can be really responsive to photodynamic therapy and so, but you know, usually I treat those, I, I think that more and more anti-VEGF therapy has become the first line treatment. Most of those things get treatment with anti-VEGF therapy and then depending on the response you can do an ICG angiogram and see if there are any feeder vessels that would potentially respond to. Uh, photodynamic therapy. The other thing that's cool that will be coming online for photodynamic therapy is treatment of small choroidal melanomas with a light activated molecule that we inject into the eye. It gloms onto the choroidal melanoma cells and then we treat it with a PDT wavelength laser, 689 nanometer laser, and that activates those light acti that light activated. It's actually a bunch of light activated molecules attached to a viral capsid and then that viral capsid attaches itself to the melanoma cells, and then you hit it with this, and it creates a bunch of, bunch of free radicals that then destroy the tumor cells. So we're involved in the clinical trial for that in our practice, and it's actually a really cool, promising technology. It's in phase one, phase two studies right now. But uh, that looks like it, it may have a lot of potential to treat small choroidal melanomas in terms of treating larger choroidal melanomas. So right now, the threshold on that study is choroidal melanomas that are less than three millimeters in thickness. If it's over three millimeters in thickness, they're not eligible for the study. But then, you know, the question someday will become, can we treat medium-sized choroidal melanomas with the thickness of, you know, four or five, six millimeters, and will they respond to this sort of treatment? So anyway, that's something that's on the brink and really exciting. Um, photodynamic therapy, do you guys see much photodynamic therapy here? We do. Um Bernstein does it a lot. Um, I'm trying to think of what this patient had. Uh, no, it wasn't that. Polypoid? No, I think it, mu it must have just been CSCR that we did it the other yeah. day with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've only seen Bernstein do it, though. I haven't seen it. You haven't else. seen Tesker okay. anybody no. else do it? Uh -uh. Just, just to throw out some, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about PDT treatment because, remember, what you're doing is this is a dye that is carried for the poor for in predominantly the albumin of your blood, in the serum. And that dye, you're hoping, is going to be absorbed by this, let's call it, problematic endothelial cells of the choriocapillaris and pigment epithelium that are causing the leakage. But the difficulty there is you're having a significant leakage that's coming through into the subretinal space that you're activating now with your dye, laser. And that does create photoreceptor burns, well not burns, let's call it injury, that we have not really assessed very well by, again, by uh, our usual visual acuity, high contrast, photo, you know, photopic kind of, of vision. But when you test these people, so I've talked with 
the vertiporphyrin people and said, come on, what is this half, half laser uh, kind of thing? Why haven't we done a controlled trial so we can look at the dose response curve for either, for the laser, because you're giving a standard dose for the treatment. But I still haven't received much, much response yet. So I think we've got- A lot got of people have gone to reduce fluence, PDT, where they don't do the full fluence, so they reduce yeah. the power by half. Yeah, but, but, but this is just a guess, gang. Come yeah, on. no, we it, it do, is. We need to do some sort of better analysis of that laser intensity. Right. And the, and the thing for, you know, for doing central serous types of leakage. Right. Because you're right, there are those that don't respond to the standard focal laser photocoagulation or micropulse that we need to do it, and we just, I've got to figure out, you know, I think, how can we do it better? Right. That's, that's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't... Oh, those are... My, 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 my um, enthusiasm sometimes gets ahead of me. Oh, that's good. So I was at a DRCR uh, network meeting, uh, an investigators meeting, when we were uh, working on Protocol T. And, uh, and then after, you know, Protocol T and Protocol S came out, uh, I think it was Neil Bressler said, well, is it time to just throw away our lasers altogether? So anyway, I don't think it is. But it's interesting because this whole section is something that's, that's not used as much. But I think that during residency and fellowship potentially, I think get as much experience as you can with it. Because one thing that I've noticed is that my general ophthalmology colleagues often feel really uncomfortable with focal laser treatment because they just have hardly done it. They're worried about causing foveal burns and things like that. So anyway, while you're in the training setting, get as, you know, if there's an opportunity to do a focal laser treatment, and especially if you've got somebody with diabetic macular edema and you've got a tight little cluster of microaneurysms in the superior temporal macula or something like that, and it's not fovea involved diabetic macular edema, but still clinically significant diabetic macular edema, those are ideal patients to do focal laser treatment on. So, you know, get as much experience as you can doing laser treatment on those folks. But do it light. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so these are just some of the milestones in vitreo retinal surgery, which is our next topic. And so, you know, it was really taboo for a long time to touch the vitreous. I mean, the, the thought process was that if you touch the vitreous, the patient would go blind. And why would those patients go blind? Well, often it was because they developed these massive retinal tears or massive tractional retinal detachments, and then, um, and then they'd go blind. So anyway, nobody really knew how to safely remove the vitreous from inside of the eye. Um, so 1850, Helmholtz inv invents the ophthalmoscope. Uh, in 1919, Jules Gonin uh, introduces this technique that he called ignipuncture. In 1949, Custodus develops scleral buckling. And in 1955, uh, uh, Tsugio Dodo introduced open sky vitrectomy. And then in 1959, Haruta published on a closed system vitrectomy system. But the person that we're going to talk about a little bit more is Bob Mockamer. So Bob Mockamer is one of my heroes. So he's got a really interesting story. He grew up in Germany. And to put himself through uh, medical school, he worked in a steel mill and learned the milling process and how to make, you know, really precise fine instruments. So in the late 60s, he got this NATO scholarship to go to Miami to the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. And there he started working with closed vitrectomy, surge, uh, closed vitrectomy systems to remove the vitreous. And as a result of that, he developed the first vitrectomer, uh, vitrector and the vitrectomy cutter. And he did this kind of on his own, on his own time with his own instruments. I mean, reportedly in his garage, but you know, who knows where he actually developed it. But he developed the first vitrector. And so uh, he always kind of thought that in order to make progress, we have to do things that are unconventional, that everybody else thinks is a little bit crazy. But as a result of his work, he became the uh, father of modern vitrectomy surgery, so to speak. So in 1971, he developed this Visc cutter, which was a 17 gauge vitrectomy cutter. Steve, what year did you do your fellowship? In uh, 78. 78. So, I mean, for Steve, this was kind of brand new technology yes. when he was doing his residency and fellowship. I know for my partners, Greg Brinton and Mano Swartz, I mean, this was brand new stuff. I think Mano was in his fellowship from, in, in I don't know, 77 or so. And uh, anyway, brand new stuff, really exciting <laughs> stuff, but it was a one port parse plane of vitrectomy, and here's a picture of that. And so they would go in through the parse plane, but this thing was huge, a 17 gauge cutter that they would put into the eye, and you compare that today's, to uh, today's 25 and 27 gauge cutters, 
I mean, the thing just looks massive inside of the eye. Yeah, we would just stick it inside the eye, and we just said, for a while, and they'd say, do you think it's enough, Steve? Uh, after 15 minutes, oh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> and then pull it out. <laughs> Here's a video of the VIS cutter in 1972. <laughs> oh so you've got this thing as big as your finger. I don't know if I'm Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I mean, you look how far back they are posteriorly, and, you think, are they not it? getting into the aura serratum, potentially causing peripheral retinal breaks? Mm -hmm. But this is the cut rate. So what do our current cutters go? About 10,000 cuts per minute. This thing did, what, like 15 cuts per minute? I was going to say 15 to 20, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah, and we didn't have any good lighting, so you couldn't see the damn stuff that you were cutting. Well, I think the first 10 patients that Bob Mollett <coughs> uh, this on ended up being like NLP blind eyes. But then eventually they refined the techniques and they got better and better. But you know, these are likely eyes that were heading for the bucket anyway, so to speak. And that, you know, these were eyes with dense vitreous hemorrhage or bad membranes or something like that, eyes that probably weren't going to see anyway. But, but I just, you know, the, uh, the amount of gumption and courage that it took to do this on the first series of patients is pretty impressive to me. Um, so these are some of the milestones. They eventually got it down to where it was a three-port pars plane of vitrectomy, 20 gauge, and that remained the standard for several decades. And uh, in fact, in my training, we did 20 gauge vitrectomy mostly. So in my fellowship from 2005 to 2007, 25 gauge and 27 gauge, or excuse me, 23 and 25 gauge were just coming on board. But still, the majority of the surgery that I did in my fellowship during the mid-2000s was done with 20-gauge vitrectomy sur surgery. So, you know, we were taking down conge and sewing in the infusion line and, and doing all that stuff, which in today's world we hardly ever do. In fact, I can't even remember the last 20-gauge vitrectomy that I did. I, I used to do them a lot for trauma cases because I thought they were really useful in trauma cases. In, our, in the current world, in our surgery centers, it's hard to even find 20-gauge vitrectomy stuff. I don't even know that our current surgical centers stock 20-gauge vitrectomy packs. So that's how far we've come and, and how much it's diverged from 20-gauge you know, vitrectomy surgery. But anyway, things have just gotten better, better and better over the past uh, several decades to the point now where we do almost all of our cases 25 and 23-gauge. So Steve, you do vitrectomy surgery still? Yeah. So. They've, they've suggested that when I come out here, I please, not because they have an adequate number of, of but, but yes, I, I, I sort of started vitrectomies. I work with Don May because the whole back thing back then is you had one instrument you were sticking inside the eye, trying to do suction and infusion. We didn't have any lighting except through the microscope. And Don uh, was the first one to suggest three ports, infusion, suction, and illumination. And everybody was saying, why do I have to make three you know, holes in the eye when I've been used to doing one? But that really inaugurated the ability to, to do the separate instruments that we wanted to, to get the right lighting inside the eye, that we could illuminate it. And that's what really, I think, promoted the whole systems and the faster cutting rates, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Really enabled us to control the suction, the traction. I remember going to uh, uh, Larry Yanuzzi, Larry Nuzzi's office in a course, and I think it was Rob, it was Dr. Mockermer, who basically stuck a needle inside the eye with a curved tip and stuck it under a membrane and ripped it off, and we all went, whoa! And, but he was able to show at that time that at least we could delaminate the membranes from the surface of the retina. That was the first demonstration. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool stuff, and it's amazing yeah, but, how but, far but we've really come. Traumatic. What we're really going for now is to be able to control what we do in a microscopic way. Will we be able to get robotic hands that will do it better than our own hands? Not yet. We really haven't got eight degrees of freedom of motion. And endoscopic surgery is great, except that we don't have the depth perception with the endoscopic surgery that we've had with the biome that was in, in, inaugurated by Eckert and the guys in, in, in Europe. Right. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm, that's awesome. I, I, but he's lived it. I mean, that's, yeah, that's why it's it. fun. I started vitrectomy, and yeah. so it's, it's, it's sort of fun to see. It's fun to hear that perspective. Uh, just a little bit of trivia. Does anybody know where endophotocoagulation was developed? Endo laser? 
Yeah, so my partner, Mano Swartz, developed endolaser photocoagulation here at the University of Utah. So one of the nice things about smaller gauge vitrectomy systems, so when I was in my fellowship and we did a lot of 20 gauge vitrectomy surgery, that's a one millimeter incision. If we're doing 25 gauge vitrectomy surgery, that's a half millimeter incision. So the nice thing about these smaller incision sizes is you get much less postoperative hypotony. And so you don't have to worry about that quite as much. And occasionally we've seen bad or ugly complications as a result of postoperative hypotony and bleeding re related to postoperative hypotony, sometimes choroidals and things like that. So, um, so these are some of the advantages and disadvantages. Of course, uh, some of the advantages include that it creates a shorter operative time because you're not taking down conjunctiva. but we'd always take down conjunctival flaps temporally and nasally to put in our ports. We don't do that anymore. Uh, the patients are way more comfortable. In fact, I came out of my fellowship. I did a 25 or 23 gauge vitrectomy surgery. This is in my first few months of, uh, of, uh, of being out here in Utah. And I did it for a patient who lived in Layton. I don't know if you guys know Trevin Wall, and he's an ophthalmologist up in, in Layton. And I did this vitrectomy surgery, and Trevin saw him like a day or two later after I'd done the surgery. And he said, and he called me, and he was kind of a little agitated. He said, I thought you said you did a vitrectomy surgery on this patient. I said, well, yeah, I, I did do a vitrectomy surgery. Well, that, that's impossible. How can his eye look so quiet and look so good after vitrectomy surgery? And he just didn't realize that, you know, using 25 gauge vitrectomy surgery, that there was very little redness to the eye. Fortunately, there was no subconjunctival hemorrhage in this patient. And the patient's eye really looked pretty white and quiet and pristine. And he just couldn't believe that the patient had had a vitrectomy with a membrane peel uh, just days before. So anyway, it does result in increased patient comfort as well as uh, faster visual recovery. And again, you know, these are some of the things that came up. And I think that they're not as much of a problem now, but postoperative hypotony. There were some initial concerns about the increased risk of endophthalmitis or potentially um, epithelial downgrowth into the incisions, into the wounds, because we weren't taking them conj. And then there were initially concerns about the increased risk of retinal tears. Actually, as it's turned out, there are probably fewer retinal tears with small gauge vitrectomy. Um, so these are some of the indications for uh, vitrectomy and with regard to macular disease. So we do a lot of epiretinal membrane peels. We take care of vitromacular traction and, and then, of course, report, repair macular holes. Submacular hemorrhages are sometimes evacuated using vitrectomy surgery. And uh, again, there was a submacular surgery trial where they removed subfoveal crotal neovascular membranes. I don't see this done by anybody anymore, but again, when I was starting my training, the submacular surgery trial by Matt Thomas in St. Louis was a big thing. Uh, by the time I had finished my fellowship, again, this had really fallen out of favor, but <laughs> anti-VEGF therapy had come along, and uh, as a result, the outcomes were so much better. Uh, this is an epiretinal membrane. On average, they get about two lines of vision improvement, or halfway back to 2020. Uh, this is an example of vitromacular traction. Often these patients will have metamorphopsia and blurred vision, and they often will improve a lot once you go in and peel that epiretinal membrane and relax that traction and get rid of the edema, and then their visual acuity improves thereafter. Uh, these are the stages of macular hole. I'm sure you've seen these or reviewed these in the past. Um, and this is what it looks like on OCT. I don't really believe that's a stage for macular hole. This comes from Heidelberg. They say that's a stage for macular hole. What's the definition of a stage four macular hole? PVD. PVD. I don't think that patient has a complete PVD. I, I would bet uh, that if you looked at the optic nerve that you would still see vitreous tethered at the optic nerve. So I don't think that's truly a stage four full thickness macular hole. Or at least I wouldn't call it a stage four full thickness you macular hole. you used Detrea at all around here? In, do any of the I have used Detrea. I don't think it works great. It's got a 26% success exactly. rate. It sometimes causes dyschromatopsia where their color yes. vision gets thrown off, and sometimes even serous macular detachments. I think Jatre is a, a very I mediocre really to poor product. product. I, I, would, I would second that across the country. I think that pretty much it's, people have said um, there are too many of the downsides problems. I didn't know if you had used it at all out here. The other thing, the pricing of the medication was, was pretty expensive. I think it was $4,000 per dose is what the way they priced it. We've got a private surgical center down the road here where we can do a vitrectomy for $4,000. With my vitrectomies, I'm gonna have a 98, 99% success rate with you know very low rate of complications. And if I use Vigetria, I'm worried about dyschromatopsia and serous macular detachments and things like that. Yeah, now do so. you, in the, in, uh, again, in the cataract world here, 
do you use any intravitreal, in other words, infusion antibiotics during your cataract surgery? You don't. Mm -hmm. Intravitreal? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, <coughs> in your infusion no. fluid, do you use any uh, antibiotics? Like intercameral? Or, yeah. Or yes. For cataracts, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think okay. they just, they just would well, do you want injection, right? Not one injection. Not one injection. Okay. Case. All right. There's, you know, no, there's, there's, there's this chamber. whole, you know, the rate, the rate <coughs> with vitrectomy of endophthalmitis is somewhere around one in 2,000 to one in 5,000. <coughs> And I think the secondary effects of these antibiotics can create all kinds of problems. And I'm sorry, I've been very critical of the cataract world in trying to prevent endophthalmitis. Again, with a very, very low consequence, but I think an unrealized problems of these intravitreal antibiotics. I'm just, I'll just let you know I'm... Yeah, I'm but you know, at the same time, we are covering endophthalmitis today, but one of the things, you look at the data that's come out of Europe, and their rates of endophthalmitis are so much lower than what we've experienced in the United States with their intracameral use of antibiotics. I don't know. And, and for an anterior segment surgeon, that's like one of the most catastrophic complications they can yeah, have. Yeah, but when you talk about between 1 in 2,000 and 1 in 5,000, it's... But it's higher for cataract surgery. Vitrectomy yeah. surgery has a lower incidence of, of infections. So, um, again, this is fairly obsolete, but occasionally they used to do partial plate of vitrectomy for crudal neovascularization. Um, so, um, you can also use pars plate of vitrectomy, of course, for complications of diabetic retinopathy, including vitreous hemorrhage, diabetic tractional detachment, and diabetic macular edema. I don't see this being done as much anymore with the advent of anti-VEGF therapy. Since Rise and Ride came out, uh, looking at loose sentence for diabetic macular edema in 2012, I think that uh, the number of people doing diabetic uh, vitrectomy with membrane peel for diabetic macular edema has really gone down. So that's not completely fallen by the wayside, but anyway, here's an example of a, vitre of a vitrectomy surgery, and we're getting a little short on time. This is a, a 23 gauge system that I'm using. This is a gentleman with diabetic retinopathy and vitreous hemorrhage. So I usually use a 0.3 forcep to stabilize the globe. Here's the 23 gauge trocard that I'm surgeon. <coughs> um, with 23 gauge wound construction, it's a lot more important to be careful about your wound construction. And there's a lot of debate about the optimal wound construction, but I usually go in at an angle of 30 to 45 degrees when I go into the sclera. And then I usually uh, become orient more perp perpendicular to the globe as I go in. Of course, um, then hooking up the infusion line, putting in the other ports here, so we go, going superior nasal and superior temporal. And so I'm sitting at the head of the bed, so this is upside down. Um, but this guy had, he had vitreous hemorrhage and he had an epiretinal membrane and had some diabetic macular edema. So we went in and cleaned him out and peeled the epiretinal membrane. Um, this is the lens we use. This, so this is called a Clarivit lens. It's a contact lens. We've got a great assistant who's been with our practice since 1985. She's really capable. And so we have the luxury of being able to use these handheld lenses because she's so good at it. In places, in places where that's not a possibility. So compare this with uh, the VISC cutter that you saw in Bob Mockmer's surgery from 1972. It's just a far cry. This is the cutter that this this video is actually several years old. So at this point in time, it was 5,000 cuts per minute. But I'm removing the vitreous hemorrhage here. You can see the wisps of vitreous hemorrhage coming into the port on the cutter, and then you can see the pooling of the hemorrhage here over the posterior pole. So you see that this gentleman has had panretinal photocoagulation in the past. So here I'm just removing. I'm aspirating some of the vitreous hemorrhage. <coughs> off of the posterior pole so that I can better visualize the macula and uh, see what's happening in the posterior pole. I'm injecting some ICG into the eye to stain the epiretinal membrane. And so by doing this, I can then see the epiretinal membrane and better and more completely remove it as well as the internal limiting membrane. So one of the thoughts with diabetic macular edema and vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema is that it's beneficial to remove the internal limiting membrane uh, and that helps to alleviate the diabetic macular edema. Uh, again, he had a little bit of pooling of hemorrhage over the posterior pole, over the macula. You can see the exudates here in his macula. There's his optic nerve. But I'm using the aspiration, or I'm using the silicone tip extrusion cannula to just puff some of the vitreous hemorrhage off the surface of the macula. 
And uh, that's in an effort to clear my view so that I can better, better visualize the membrane. And then here I am with the ILM forcep and uh, just grasping the epiretinal membrane and the internal limiting membrane. So there are different ways of starting an, a membrane peel. Some people use like a barbed 25 gauge needle. Some people will just do a pinch and pull type of start to the epiretinal membrane peel. I usually just do a pinch and pull, just very gingerly grabbing the epiretinal membrane and internal limiting membrane, and then starting to peel. You can see the internal limiting membrane and epiretinal membrane right there. This is, uh, I believe that's his phobia right there, but anyway, it's got a lot of exudates just adjacent to phobia, so we're trying to help him out by doing the vitrectomy to clear the vitreous hemorrhage as well as peeling the membrane from the macula so as to help with any diabetic macular edema, which he clearly had. And then sometimes people put just a little bit of air in the eye, and it seems that by putting a little air bubble in the eye at the end of the surgery, it helps the sclerotomies to close. Especially if you've done an angled entry, it kind of pushes the flaps together and helps to create a position between the flaps of that angled entry and uh, just helps the sclerotomies to close a little bit more easily. With 23 gauge vitrectomy, sometimes you'll see a little bit more hypotony than you do with 25 gauge vitrectomy. So in that situation, again, sometimes having a little air bubble in the eye at the end of the surgery is beneficial. But anyway, that's the end of the surgery. So that's vitrectomy surgery for a diabetic in a nutshell. Um, vitrectomy can also be used for complications of anterior segment surgery. And uh, this is certainly something that as a retina surgeon, we get a lot of calls on. You know, our colleagues will call and say, you know, we've, I've had this problem in the operating room. Can you clean out the nuclear fragments and things like that or put a lens in? The thing I find myself doing more and more is putting in secondary IOLs these days. So I'll put in an acreos and suture it to the sclera. Sometimes we do an anterior chamber lens. But um, this is postoperative endophthalmitis. We've talked a little bit about this. Time frame's important. Less than six weeks is acute. Over six weeks is chronic. The reason that's important to keep in mind is to just kind of keep in mind what sort of bacteria potentially, thanks Teresa, um, that could potentially be causing the endophthalmitis. But anyway, that's essentially the end of uh, the lecture. We could go through the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study. Um, but this is all changing very rapidly. And uh, the thing that's cool about life in the retina world is just to see the developments and see how many things are changing and evolving. And the reality is, is that what we're doing currently for macular degeneration is going to change dramatically in the next five to 10 years. So things like uh, long-term anti-VEGF agents and intravitreal injections and, you know, all these things are just going to change so markedly in the next five to 10 years. It's really a cool time to be in our profession. So any parting thoughts or comments? Steve, any thoughts or comments? <laughs>